Hey bosses, before we kick off this episode, I want to tell you about our sponsor this week, Nom Nom. Your pet's a member of the family. Don't feed them like they're in the doghouse. Give them Nom Nom. Nom Nom delivers fresh dog food with every portion personalized to your dog's needs so you can bring out their best. Nom Nom is made with real whole food you can see and recognize. No additives or fillers that contribute to bloating and low energy. Nom Nom uses the latest science and insights to make real good good food for dogs. In fact, they've already delivered over 40 million meals to good dogs like yours, inspiring millions of clean bowls and tail wags. You can check out Nom Nom right now for 50% off. You get a no risk two week trial when you go to trynom.com slash iLab. That's trynom.com slash iLab. T-R-Y-N-O-M dot com slash I-L a B, you're gonna get 50% off a two-week trial. I'll tell you even more about Nom Nom in a minute, but for now, let's kick off this episode of Invest Like a Boss. Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. I'm Derek Sparks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. What is up, bosses? Episode 259 of the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Derek Sparts here in Los Angeles. I got Johnny on the other end. I can tell by the background. He's in his apartment in Ukraine, and he has electricity. Things are looking up in 2023, Johnny. You know, I came into 2023 with a bang. Actually, 10 bangs. Uh-oh. <laughs> Explain. I was getting ready for my New Year's Eve party. And six minutes after 2 p.m., I start hearing rockets, these huge explosions. My windows are shaking, and I'm like, oh, God, this is not good. So I do exactly what I'm not supposed to do. I run out to the balcony to to see what's going on. (laughs) Well, you got to put it on YouTube, right? (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, it's on there. Uh, And it's like... Uh, it's it, explosions are going off. A uh, car alarms near me are, uh, you know, are activated. So it's close by. I f- I feel bad laughing about this. It's it's like, it's like not real though. I mean, obviously it's real to you. It's just weird being, I guess, in my sheltered little America spot and thinking that that's reality. You know, honestly, it wasn't that real for me until it was that close. Like I've always read about it, or heard about it. But I've never personally been within, you know, shaking range of a of a missile. And I was like, oh my God, this is not okay. This is this is scary. Um luckily they were all service to air missiles. So they were the air defense going up and not the rockets coming down. Well, that's a good sign. I d I don't know what to what to think of this. It's is there anything to be believed in what Russia is saying, because one day they say they want to have talks, and then the next day they're sending missiles. It's just it's a confusing situation. Before you know February twenty fourth, two thousand twenty two, I gave Russia the benefit of the doubt. I was like, you know what? Yeah, maybe they're not so bad after all. Maybe they learned their lessons. You know, maybe they really you know are the uh, nice guys again. Now, I mean, after. Nine months of the war, I realized you can't listen. You can't trust Russia at all. Like they're just, they're they're like that gaslighting liar that stabs you in the back. You know, like it's you just can't listen to them. Yeah, and Ukraine kind of feels like the the little like stepbrother. Like you 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 don't really belong to the UN, and you're not Russia, but Russia wants you, and UN's like I don't know, do we want you? So it's kind of a weird little like situation that you guys are in right now. It actually reminds me of high school. I got into a mm, altercation. <laughs> I love how you had to think about the term for a second. Hmm, how should I put this? Yeah. So basically, I got beat up by like a little mini gang in our school. And there was like a crew of them. You know, this is high school. So at the time, it was scary as crap for me because I was, you know, young. Now looking back, you know, I probably would have handled it differently, but when you're a teenager and there's like a crew of like 12 guys 
who wait for you after school and beat you up. It's not, it's, it's a scary, very scary situation. Uh, and I didn't have that many friends, so I didn't know what to do. Uh, I, I was really stuck. Luckily, there was this guy who was a grade above me and somehow we were in the same math class and I, I would let him cheat off of me. <laughs> so, <laughs> Just reinforcing stereotypes here. Johnny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he liked me and I, you know, I like, I, I was really stressed one day and he's like, Hey, what's, what's wrong? And I said, like, I'm, I'm getting beat up by these guys. Um, and this guy, you know, he was older, he was a senior and he had his crew of like 10 guys. So they said, you know, look, we're, we're not going to get directly involved because we don't, you know, it's not our fight and we don't want to get in trouble, but we'll go there and back you up. Go tell that guy, the main guy, I'll fight you one on one and we'll be there. So the friends don't jump in. So it, it could be a fair fight. And this is how I feel like what U.S. is doing in Russia or, or with Ukraine. Ukraine is like is the 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 guy who was getting bullied. All right. And Russia was like this, you know. You know, it's like oh, nobody can stop us. You know, we're, we're we're bigger, more powerful. We have more, more ammo. And the U.S. is like, look, wait, 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 wait. We're not going to get involved directly, but we're going to make sure this little guy, Ukraine, doesn't get you know doesn't get his butt kicked. And we'll has a we'll fair teach fight. him some fighting skills and uh, provide some <laughs> weapons, but uh, that's, that's about as far as we'll go. But yeah, we're there. We're yeah. still there. <laughs> yeah, I will make sure that Russia, like you know, fights you know relatively fair. You know, right. doesn't cross too many boundaries. You know, because they know they do that. You know, NATO's going to come in, and it really will be a three day war. Yeah, it's it's a it's a terrible situation. I can't believe you're almost coming up on a year on that now. Yeah, so let's see let's see what our updates for the end of uh, 2023 are. But hopefully that that'll, that'll be something we reminisce about. <laughs> let's not talk about still. So. Yeah, we're always thinking about you, Johnny. Uh, hopefully things will. That's the closest that any kind of missile will come to you in at any time. Let's talk about what we're actually talking about this year. Um, I feel like 2022 was a lot of kind of these catch ups. What's going on? Obviously, your your Ukraine situation. We delved deeper into more personal subjects. Let's get back to investing. I mean, it was a it was a it was a strange year. I think I think 2022 is the first year of the podcast where the market in general was actually down for the year. I don't think that's happened since the podcast has started. So it was a really challenging year. I think we need to have a few more episodes to kind of get back into some of these alternative spaces. So this week we're talking to the real asset investor. His name is Dave Zook. I actually found out about him through a Patreon recommendation. If you want to recommend guests to be on the show, I try my hardest to get them on. I I apologize. I don't remember the actual patron that did recommend this. I did have it in my notes as a Patreon recommendation though. So Whoever you are, I'm sure you know about this. Yeah, and I think this is actually an interesting topic because there's a lot of programs like this. I don't even know how to describe this investment class. It's not your traditional investment where you're going through um, a stockbroker or for real estate, even a um, you know a fund. This is, I don't want to call it like a private placement, but it's like an alternative investment where there's a type of like business opportunity or something and they're like, okay, I'm going to invest in this through this company or this guy um, to do something that otherwise would be complicated for, for, for me to get into. So I like the idea of real assets. Uh, I've actually met people who have invested in things like car washes before and I always thought it was a cool idea. So I'm excited to hear what his style is and what, what his, his fund does. And then afterwards, Let's come back on and talk about if we would invest in something like this, why or why not? Yeah, so this is a business model that I don't think is necessarily unique because we have seen other people do it. But when you're investing this type of money, you're also investing into the personality. So Johnny, uh, we're going to have you talk to Dave Zook. He's the real asset investor. Let's have you bosses listen to him and see what you think. And then Johnny and I will come back and circle around and see if this is something that we would invest in as well. This week's sponsor of Invest Like a Boss is Nom Nom. They deliver fresh dog food with every portion personalized to your dog's specific needs so you can bring out their best. 
What you feed your dog is just as important as what you put into your own body. It's time for real good food backed by science. Nom Nom features pup-pleasing favorites like chicken cuisine and beef mash. And every Nom Nom meal features high-quality proteins and vegetables mixed with targeted vitamins and minerals to provide the essential nutrition dogs need at every life stage. In fact, Nom Nom's ingredients are cooked individually and then mixed. They're not just thrown into some huge pot and all stirred together. You can see each individual ingredient in every portion of Nom Nom dog food. This gives your dog efficient energy and packs in the vitamins and minerals they need to get the most out of every single bite. Plus, Nom Nom comes with a money back guarantee. If your dog's tail isn't wagging within 30 days, Nom Nom will refund your first order. And I'm also going to give you half off your first order. You'll get a no risk two week trial at trynom.com com slash iLab. That's 50% off your first two-week trial at trynom.com slash iLab. One more time, T-R-Y-N-O-M.com slash I-L-A-B. All right, Dave, welcome to the show. Hey, Johnny, thanks for having me on your show. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm excited. So, First big question is why real assets versus kind of more traditional stocks or real estate, kind of uh, the bread and butter? Oh, my goodness. That could be the entire show right there. But uh, I mean, so uh, from a just one minute version, you are number one, you're operating outside of Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Uh, You've got more control of your own money. You're closer to the asset. And and let me give you an example of that. We have a self-storage fund, right? So we buy self-storage assets. You could go to Wall Street and buy a stock that, uh, you know, from a publicly traded REIT that does Mm self-storage. The difference is you've got, you know, two, three, four, five, six different layers of of, um, organizations or folks or people scraping fees or different different fees that is coming off of that before it gets to you the investor and then you know it, it you know you could have a general market crash correction you know just any kind of you know some kind of news that would make the the general market um uh, you know slow down crash correct whatever and you would be negatively, most likely be negatively affected. It doesn't matter if your asset is doing just fine. It doesn't matter if the income is from your asset went up the month before. You're subject to whatever the market's feeling. And so what I usually say is our fund, which gives you access to the same sort of product, gets you next in line. Like you're as close to that product as you possibly could be without actually owning it yourself. You have the asset. You have the management team, and then it's you. So there's only one group between you and the actual asset. You can own that asset yourself, then you have to manage it and take care of it and do all the stuff that we do. But it gets you closer to the asset than than investing through a, a publicly traded REIT. Okay, it definitely makes sense. But speaking of real assets, I think the three that you guys focus on a lot, um, self-storage, the ATMs, and the car washes, uh, why do you guys like these three as opposed to like, for example, a restaurant or uh, a nightclub or some, or coffee shop? A couple of reasons. I started really becoming interested in self-storage um, in 2017 when I first, when we first entered the space, actually I'd been, I had been interested prior to that, but didn't ha- really have a good entry point, didn't have a great team, didn't, you know, wasn't too connected in the space. I was busy doing a lot of other stuff. Um, but I recognized in, in my research that self-storage was very recession resistant, recession resistant as an asset class, you know, meaning that when there was disruption in the market, when there was a market decline, that seemed to be the asset class that did really well. And then, you know, looking where we were in the market cycle, you know, 2008 to 2017, you know, just a really nice bull run. And it just felt to me like we had more potential to take some form of a correction rather than just keep on this, you know, bull market run. And, you know, obviously we had a situation in 2020 
2021, we had COVID and you got, got a chance to see, okay, how does this thing perform? How's this asset class, class perform um, during those kinds of situations? We saw how they performed in 2008 to 2011, and, and it was one of the best performing or the best performing uh, real estate, commercial real estate asset class amongst all of its peers and how it performed. Just really being able to uh, kind of identify some of those things, some of those, you know, uh, opportunities. Same way with car wash. I mean, today's market, it's really hard to buy a stabilized asset that makes sense from a cash flow perspective, from a you know appreciation perspective. You know, you just really in this last year or so, you you know, it's 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 at its all time highs. You know, doesn't mean it couldn't go higher, but you know, it's it's hard to find an asset class that really performs for you and gives you the cash flow that you want it you know, that you, that you get in there for. And so getting in there and creating value, forcing value, the self-storage facilities that we're buying, you know, we're, we're adding climate controlled units. We're, we're adding size and scale to it. Same way with car wash. We're buying a piece of dirt and we're building a car wash on, then wrapping a business, you know, putting a business on that piece of dirt. That's how you get value in today's market, I believe. Yeah, I like it. Actually, we had a previous guest, Kevin Shi, who has self-storage in Hong Kong, and we like it as an asset class. Um, I can see why having a self-storage REIT isn't necessarily the best idea. You, you get more liquidity, but you pay for that liquidity uh, as well. Um, for the ATMs, I'm assuming these ATMs are not you know, connected to like Chase Bank or like Bank of America. These are probably ones in you know, places that you know can charge higher fees. I, I'm assuming maybe like a strip club or amusement park or uh, where do you guys normally have these ATMs? So the really good, I mean, the, the locations that we focus on is high foot traffic delis, chain stores, Walgreens, CVSs. Uh, bodegas in New York City, you know, just, you know, high, uh, number one, you got to find out where your clients are. Number one, well, no, I, let me, actually, let me back up a little bit further. Number one, you got to figure out who your clients are, right? You got to figure out who your clients are, who's who's your user, who's using the ATMs. Non then number two, you got to find out where they are. You know, you got to find out where that population of, of users are, where they live, where they congregate, where they shop, where they eat, where they go to pick up their groceries, whatever. So we're, we're in those locations that I just mentioned primarily, and that's done really well for us. And I mean, you know, going through the spring, summer of 2020 and into 2021, you know, it's one of the things that kept us from, um, really suffering from kind of the downtrend or the, the enclosures in some point of some of our peers that, who are in, you know, restaurants and nightclubs and bars. And it, well, you can imagine what happened to that business. And in, mm -hmm. in 2020, those places got shut down. Almost all of our businesses were deemed essential where our, where our ATMs were at. So location is important finding out who your customer is, finding out where they go, where they shop. I mean, that, that's super important. Yeah, I like it. And actually out here in Europe where I live, there's a brand called Euronet, which is everywhere. And they are notorious for charging high fees and giving terrible conversion rates, but they're definitely very, very profitable as well. So I can see that it works. Yeah, and and you know, the, the not only is the location um, important, it's, it's, you know, knowing how your customer reacts or how, you know, how your customer's habit is formed. You know, I mean, think about 10, 15 years ago, your typical warehouse or factory employee or, or service employee uh, got a check every, every Friday night, every, every other Friday night, they'd go to the bank and they'd take some cash out. They deposit the check, take some cash out. Now you don't get a check. That's the, that money gets deposited into your account automatically and now if you want cash, you walk to the corner deli, you walk out of your C-class apartment building, you get the cash that you need for the next week or two. That's how people operate in, in today's world. And, and, you know, our customer is, our ATM customer is the lower income. It's the immigrant. It's the EBT card carrier. They're on welfare. They, they bring that card over and they get cash. They, you know, that's our customer. And when you also, when you look at where the growth is in this country, it's that customer. 
that's one of the fastest growing demographics in our country. Yep. Makes sense. So I think you had mentioned you guys were either looking into or had launched some B ATM, some Bitcoin ATMs. Had those worked out and with the kind of collapse, the, the crypto exchanges and, and the prices dropping, has that affected you at all? Um, so we had some of our highest performing BTMs, uh, you know, months uh, over the last four, five, six months. We're not subject to, we, we're not impacted by the price point of a certain cryptocurrency. We provide a service and we get a fee for that service. We get a transaction fee. So some of our best performing months wasn't when crypto and Bitcoin was up at 69,000. It was when it was 16 to 20,000. And so, yeah, we're, we're a fee-based company. We, we charge a fee for the service that's provided and we did really well throughout that. So in answer to your question, no, we're not subject to the volatility in the price of that coin, crypto, Bitcoin, whatever it is. We get paid for a service. That definitely makes sense. So Derek, the co-host of this podcast, uh, he has read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and he saw that you were actually mentored by, I don't know, Robert Kiyosaki directly or his team. How was that experience? Yeah, so I got to, I first met him, I actually hunted Robert Kiyosaki down in 2012 and went on the Real Estate Guys Summit at Sea, primarily because him and his team were on board. And I wanted to spend some time with him. He made some statements as his as his CPA did. You know, one of the statements Robert Kiyosaki made was, you can make millions of dollars a year and pay no tax legally. And I was like, that drove me crazy because that wasn't me. I was paying a half million dollars a year in tax, making a lot of money, but I was a tax slave. His CPA uh, made the statement that if you want to change your your tax, you got to change your facts, meaning you got to change the way you do life. You got to change the way you do business. You got to change the way you invest. And that impacted me. And so I, I, I need to get around these guys. And so, yeah, I've had quite a few conversations with him, with Robert personally. Tom Will Wright, his CPA, is a friend of mine now, have had dinner with, with Robert uh, a number of times. Uh, and so, yeah, I was, I was greatly impacted by not only Robert, but Tom and Kenny and, you know, some of his, some of his team that I learned a ton. And, and yeah, they were, they were my mentors and still are. They were, they were my mentors coming out of kind of that conventional era that I was in. You know, I was thinking inside the box, like everybody else. And they did, they, they kind of shattered that, that paradigm, that, that conventional thinking. I had. That's amazing. How did you go from paying that much tax to now, you know, essentially we're nearly zero. I changed my facts. Yeah. I, I started doing business differently. I started investing differently. I, you know, back in the day when I was paying that tax, I was, I was just head down doing business, get a lot of work done, making a lot of money today. It's much more strategic. I, I, you know, I think about the investments that I make, you know, the tax piece of that's already baked in the cake. You know, I, I look at, you know, and I taught some sessions on this where I teach people to take their income column, you know, whether it's ordinary income or passive income or capital gains, put them in buckets or column. And then you find an asset class that will wipe out the tax liability on that specific kind of income. And so that's really all I did. Is I, I learned how to invest. It gives me the appreciation to offset tax liability on the different incomes that I had. Okay. So I'm sure this could be, be a whole podcast or a whole book, but I guess just real quick, like, you know, for like a physical asset, like a like an ATM or a car wash, like what are some ways to actually reduce the tax on that? Yeah, sure. So I'll give you an example. So ATMs right now, this year yet, you can get 100% bonus depreciation when you make an investment into their ATM fund. So you invest $100,000, you get a $100,000 loss shows up on your K1 year one. And so really what that does is it reduces your taxable income. You got to make sure that the kind of income that, you, that, that you're making aligns with the asset class that you're investing in. But it reduces your taxable income dollar for dollar. You make whatever, you make 500 grand, you make a $100,000 investment into an ATM. It reduces your your income by 100 grand. Now you pay tax on 400. You know where, where it really gets powerful is when you start knocking down those highest, those top tier tax brackets. You, know, you take care of the of the 37% and the 34% and the 28%. You get yourself down into the, you know, low teens, high teens, even better, single digits. Uh, if you want to get 
really strategic and live in my world, you can get it down into the low single digits consistently. But it's, you know, it's, it, you know, to, to get into that realm, um, that takes some advanced strategies. And you don't learn it all the first year. This is a lifelong learning process. We're always learning. But we got great. We got great people around us too. We got a great team. So speaking of taxes, uh, one of our Patreons, uh, Chris Young, uh, when we said you were coming on the show, he said your fund sounds interesting. But when dealing with investments spread across multiple states, tax filings can become complicated and expensive. Do you have to file multiple K ones because that gets expensive real quick? Yeah. So we had a situation a couple of years ago where. Uh, the fund was growing quickly. The fund was growing really fast and it got bigger than what we had originally intended it to be through, because of a couple of mergers and acquisitions. And we ended up having, I don't know, 20 some states in our fund. And that that created a problem because in the states that have state tax, which most of them do, Texas and Florida and Tennessee and some of those don't, but in the states that you have exposure to, the states that collect sales tax, uh, state sales tax, you had to file a return in that state. Now, it it normally didn't happen in the first couple of years because you're showing a loss in those first in that first period. So you're not showing income, you know, right up front. But eventually, you know, that became a problem that was obvious. So we changed up our business model a, a bit and made it so that if you came into the fund, you only had exposure to you know, five, six, seven states, seven, I think the seven states was the max that you would have exposure to in that fund. So it was a, it was a learning curve and it, and it happened because of growth in the fund and some mergers and acquisitions, which was good for everybody. But at the same time, it created kind of a burden on the tax, on the state tax side. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, so nowadays maximum, someone would get seven K ones, but maybe less because yeah. some states don't, don't issue them. Correct. Okay. We, we we found we found a way to mitigate and and offset that burden for our investors and kind of minimize that. Okay, that's good news. Another one of our patreons, Tom Conal, asks he's been looking into buying a car wash in Australia. Are your funds open to foreign investors, so non U.S. citizens? So the answer is we can take foreign investor capital. The only thing I would I would say on their side. It's important for them to know that you know they could be subject subject to double taxation, taxation on the U.S. side, taxation on on the other side of the pond. Um, so, so just you know, if, if you've got international capital coming in, or if you have an international investor, I would just say if you're a syndicator, just make sure that they're aware of that, and make sure that their tax team is on it, and making and and setting them up and putting them in a good position. Okay, great. And Tom uh, also mentions. He listens to Cody Sanchez, which is a previous guest of iLab, and she is anti-ATM. Any idea why? I have no idea. Uh, I can tell you our investors who've been been investing in ATMs for the last uh, 11 years are not anti-ATM. They're big ATM fans. And, you know, maybe it's, it's one of those things where maybe that person doesn't understand it. Maybe it doesn't understand the business model or who the, who the customer is or the demographic. I don't know, but I, I would be happy to have a conversation. If somebody has a mindset that this is not a good investment, I'd love to hear why and have that conversation because it's been a very good solid asset class, not only for us over the last 11 years, but if you look back, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, I mean, this has been a really good asset class. It's a good recession resistant asset class, gives you lots of consistent cash flow when you got them in the, in, in the right location. And, and that's important. You know, when you talk about real estate, what's the three most important things in real estate? Location, 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 right? Well, this is a real estate play. You know, we're using an ATM as a vehicle to monetize that piece of real estate. So it's a real estate play. So location becomes very important. So it's it's you know from a cash flow perspective, perspective, a recession resistant perspective, a depreciation, a tax impact perspective. It's a great investment. I can definitely see it working because I personally had met people in in Europe who, when I asked them why 
they had a Euronet ATM taking up half their storefront and making their store, you know, less attractive for customers. They told me that they actually make more money just from the ATM that the, uh, with them, they did some kind of revenue split than he did actually selling products in a store uh, just because he had such a high foot traffic area. Yeah, no, and, and, and it provides a valuable service mm-hmm. to that demographic. Yeah. You know, there's, there's many of us and probably including most of your listeners who don't use ATMs, don't, you know, they, they, I, I don't use ATM. I couldn't get, I own hundreds of ATMs personally. I couldn't get cash out of an ATM if I tried. So it's not for our demographic. It's for a certain certain group in the U.S. And that group is growing at a fast rate, one of the fastest in the country. Yeah, I definitely don't like paying those, those crazy high fees. So I avoid it, but I can see other people falling for it. But the, the problem with that, is I guess one potential downside is um, you know regulation coming in saying you know what if tomorrow that they make a law saying uh, these are predatory fees aimed at lo- lower income population you know you have to stop charging it what what would happen then to your network that you've built up or your fund so yeah so we don't see anything like that there's not there's been nothing like that brewing in legislation some of that you know those things take time there's not even been any kind to my knowledge there's not even been any kind of of you know conversation around that. I mean, when when you think about a two or three dollar fee for that service, you know, yeah, if you're pulling out a ten dollar bill, that's that's a nice big chunk out of that ten dollar bill. When you're pulling three hundred or five hundred out of the machine, it's like okay, it's a rounding error. So you know, we don't believe it's predatory. We believe it's a fair value for the value we bring to that group of folks. And so it, it really depends on how you look at it. Do you see it as predatory? Okay, tell me why. You know, it, 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 okay, so let me ask you a question. You live in a C-class apartment building. You have the opportunity, the flexibility to walk outside your, your apartment building, walk across the street to the corner deli, and take out 150 bucks out of the ATM machine. And you pay $3 for that service. Or you got to get in your car, you got to fight traffic, you got to drive three miles down to the branch. You got to go in the branch, get your cash out, come back. Would you rather pay the three dollars or go through that? Yeah, some people don't even have a car, so they'd have to spend yeah. an hour taking a bus. So I, I understand. I mean, this is why, you know, milk uh, costs you know three dollars at the deli and two dollars at the supermarket. Sure. So I can, yeah, I, I could see why it works um, and see why it makes money. So your fund sounds very interesting. How how do you guys make money from it? Is it a, a fee? Is it a percentage? Yeah. So normally, and and this is pretty broad, but you know the the general idea is there's one revenue source. You know that's the transaction. Uh, that's a transaction that happens. That's a surcharge from that transaction. So let's just call it three dollars. Then there's three parties that get a piece of that. You get the investor gets about roughly thirty percent. You get the uh, location owner. You know the 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 deli, the CBS, the Walgreens, whatever. They get roughly thirty percent. And these 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 percentages vary a lot. I'm just giving you the kind of the broad mm-hmm. overview. And then the management company gets around 40%. And that management fee is inclusive of, of all the costs, the maintenance, the the management, the, you know, having Brinks and Loomis bring your money out and keeping your machine stocked. I mean, all the costs flow back to the management company. So that's generally about what you would see, 30, 30, 40 or something like that. But it's it's a three-way split. Okay, definitely makes sense. So what about, for example, your your a uh, car wash fund if somebody wanted to invest is there a minimum uh how much of that goes into the the, the car wash how much of it goes into fees yeah so it's a hundred thousand dollar minimum for accredited uh, available to accredited investors what we did is got a little bit creative with this fund in that uh we sat around at the, at the very beginning when we got into the space going on three years ago, we said, this is a new asset class for us. Uh, we're, we're teaming up with a new operations team. They were new, not new to the industry, but they were new to us. There's development in this fund, quite a lot of development in this fund. Those are all three potential risks, like real risks. How do we offset or mitigate 
the risk for our investors. And then so what we did is instead of going with the typical syndication model that you see a lot, 70-30 split, 70% of the cash flow going to the going to the investors, 30% going to the sponsor, the investor gets a whatever, 7% preferred return. It might go to 50-50 after you hit a certain IRR waterfall model, whatever. We, we said, what if we scrap all of that and gave 100% of the revenue to the investor? So we've done pretty well in the last decade. And, you know, we, we got ourselves in, I got myself in a position where I, I don't need the cash flow. So I was like, not only don't I need the cash flow, I can afford to pay the setup costs and I can afford to carry the admin, the, the fund management, all that stuff out of pocket. But if I give a hundred percent of the cash flow to the investor, that will reduce their risk. In exchange for that, when they get to 1.75 X or when you invest $100,000, you get 175 back. When they get to that point, then I make money and they exit. So we're projecting that you get to the 1.75x in five years or less. And you know it could be a good bit less than five years because we're seeing a lot of private equity and institutional appetite for this asset class. Most likely, we'll get bought out between year three and year five. We're, we're set to, we're on, on course to have 60 of these Tommy's Express car washes built in the next three to four years. So we could get bought out. It doesn't matter if we get bought out early, the investor still gets their 1.75 X before I get a dime. And then I get paid on the back end. If there's upside when we sell, when, you know, or, or if we pay them out, we still own the asset after they get their 1.75 X, then I start getting paid. And then how much is that? Whatever I get paid from operations. So they get paid from operations. And then after they're out, then we get 100%. So after they get to the 1.75x, they exit. And then okay. we get whatever, whatever, you know, whatever operations deliver this. Okay, so the, the maximum upside for the investor is 1.75x. Yes. Okay. And we project and we project that it would get the investors would get to that point in five years or less, mm -hmm. and they got 100, uh, they get 100% bonus depreciation along with that, that they never have to recapture. So that's kind of a big deal because not only is it 1.75X, when you do that math, now it becomes an approximate double in five years or less. Can you explain that? How does that work? All right, I'll back up a second. So there's there's something that's unique with car washes and gas station. And that is the building can be depreciated as if it were equipment, okay? So you can take your equipment, you can, your equipment, you can write that off, uh, take the 100% the bonus depreciation in year one. You can do that with a car wash as well. Not only the equipment, but you can you can do that with the building. So very aggressive on the on the tax side. Equipment in the in the eyes of the IRS has a very limited lifetime, so it depreciates down to zero. So what that means is when you get to your 1.75x and you exit, you don't have to recapture that. You collected the premium. You've gotten you've harvested the the, the tax deductions. You've gotten the tax impact. At the end of the day, when you get to that 1.75x, there is no recapture. Not like when you invest a hundred grand in an apartment building and then you sell it in five years. Now you got to recapture that depreciation that you claim. It's not like that in the car wash space, or it's not. It's not. It's not like that in our in our fund. Okay, so let's say I invested in 100k that year. I can write off 100k in in depreciation uh, on my taxes. So therefore, saving me a bunch of of tax money. Sure. Um, you know, within five years, hopefully less. Uh, I get a check for 175,000 in, in total, kind of you know in, in chunks. That money now is just taxable as um, you know capital gains or or K, like a K one tax bet. Or that regular but, regular passive income, yeah, regular income. So then I that hundred thousand dollars in depreciation that I I took the first year, I don't have to worry about that you know, again. Yeah. So the way that would look, let's let okay, let's assume you're you're. A high tax bracket taxpayer, like most of mm -hmm. our investors are on list paid. Let's say you're in that 40% tax bracket. So now you invest 100 grand, you get 100% bonus depreciation in the first two years, not in the first year, because we got mm -hmm. some development going on. And when you take 100% bonus depreciation, you got to have your your equipment, your building, mm -hmm. your you got to be in service by 1231 of that year. Mm -hmm. So we're getting 100% bonus depreciation over two years. Mm -hmm. So Let's just say that's 40 grand. Let's say you're in a 40% tax bracket at 40 grand. So now you take your 175, you take your 175,000 on your $100,000 investment, you add the 40 because that you really got to treat that as cash when you don't have to recapture it. 
Mm-hmm. Again, it's different when you're doing apartment building, self storage, whatever. But but now you got to count that because you never recapture that. So you add the 175 and the 40 gets you to 215. So now you you know 2.15 in five years or less. Okay. Well, sounds very interesting. If somebody wants to check out uh, your funds or learn more, where can they go? So our website is therealassetinvestor.com. And I'll give you an email that'll take you directly to the team. You're going to get the best service when you go to this one because you got access to everybody in the team. Info at therealassetinvestor.com. And if you have a question on any one of these, if you're a listener who doesn't like ATMs, wants to engage us and have a conversation, love that. Uh, if they want information on any one of the asset classes that we that we're involved in, to send an email to info at the real asset investor dot com and we'll we'll engage them. All right. Well, David, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great interview, Johnny. I appreciate you taking that, talking to Dave on this. He talked about three main subjects, self-storage, which we've covered uh, quite a bit on the show, ATMs, and car washes. I I like all three. I do have an issue with one of them, which I think I'll bring up in a little bit. But what are some of your initial thoughts about investing in these assets? So the assets itself, I've always been very fascinated in. Uh, I think it's a... A very lucrative business. Like whenever I see, you know, these ATMs that are privately owned, um, whether it's uh, the Euronet kind of ripoff ones uh, in <laughs> Europe, or the ones I, I've used at trip clubs that charge you a, a nine dollar fee, I can see why it works, and I also see why people like convenience, um, especially nowadays where things are mostly cashless. It's actually ironic that. People like need ATMs more often because they carry cash, cash less often. So in the kind of random times they do need cash, they don't have it on them. So they have to go out of their way and be like, okay, what's close by that can just grab 20 bucks or 40 bucks. I'm glad that you brought that up too, because I've used those Euronet machines. <clears throat> I know exactly what you're talking about. Sometimes, at least like if you're at an airport or wherever you are, you can't avoid it. If you really need cash, you, you got to pay those fees. And I'm glad you called them out on that. Because I listened to another interview with him that I I don't remember the podcast offhand, but they basically just uh, praised everything that Dave had to say, and and I like I like almost everything that Dave had to say, and you kind of you kind of alluded that uh, this is kind of maybe not necessarily predatory, but he he made it pretty clear that he's going after low income people that need twenty bucks, forty bucks, whatever it may be. And I've been that broke. If if you're paying a two, four, five dollar fee just to get twenty bucks out because that's all you have in your account, that sucks. Honestly, it sucks. Yeah, it, it does suck. And I don't know. It's hard. I mean, as far as the actual assets, like I like them. You know, I I I, I can see why they make money. Um, you know, predatory or not, I can see why they make money. Like, I mean, to be honest, if I can start a uh, payday loan, you know, um center and get you know 50 percent interest i would look into it <laughs> like, <laughs> but you know i think that these uh yeah i don't i don't know the the atm model like i don't know enough about it um for me to personally you know want to invest and, and start one atm you know have a deal with a store or something and put my own atm in there i think this is something that you need to scale which is why euronet does so well is because they're a big brand they have a you know they have they have scale and this is what's the appeal of a fund like uh uh mr zooks is it's scalable it has a you know has something behind it so the actual assets itself i actually like it uh what i don't like is the split so let's go over that split. He said, let's say there's a $3 fee on an ATM, essentially $1 of that is going back to the store or retail location, wherever it's located, CVS, Walgreens, the bodega, whatever that may be. Another dollar is going to uh, maintain it. You know, Brinks has to come put money in it. If it breaks down, they need to send a tech and the remaining goes to the investor. So it's about a one third split um, all around. But that's not forever, right? I'm, I'm assuming that also caps out like his other investments at 175%. That's the that's the interesting part here. I don't think I've ever seen a fund 
split like this where he caps you out at essentially making 75% profit. And then from there on, he says, I'm going to take over the business and it's a hundred percent mine. Yeah. Like I, I, that's the, that's the main part where I wouldn't, I wouldn't invest because I'm putting all the, all the risk by putting my money in. And if the, in the best case scenario, I get my money back and 75% more, like, that's not worth it for me. Like on an unsecured uh, business where like, I don't know what's going to happen with this money. And, and yeah, making five, you know, 75% over five years is decent. You know, it's 15% a year. It's pretty good. But having no upside potential ab- above that and having a hundred percent downside potential that's not something I would do. Yeah, so I guess the way to look at it is you're you're not going to have that giant home run exit, but at the same time, he's not seeing anything until that 1.75 hits. So he's banking on himself that he can grow it to that level, and it sounds like he's very confident that'll happen within five years. So if you're looking at a 15% return per year, uh, it sounds pretty good, especially when you add the, the tax benefits in there of the, let's say you invested $100,000, you'd essentially get $100,000 in the first two years of tax write-offs. So that 175, he's saying, if you're in the top tax bracket of 40%, you're essentially seeing 215. So you're doubling your money in five years if, if everything goes as planned. Yeah, so that's the one reason why I can see someone investing if that was a, a way to actually get the, that tax, tax write-off and there wasn't another way to get that tax write-off. Um, at the same time, I would never invest in something just for tax write-off. I remember, I don't want to call him out, but let, let's say a stupid person I know, <laughs> he had a bunch of like these, uh, you know, no name supplements at his house. It's like powdery supplements. And I'm like, why do you have so many? And he was like, oh, I signed up for, um, you know, this uh, multi-level marketing thing. And I was Uh-oh. like, why? <laughs> and he's like, don't worry, I'm you know I get all the money back in uh, tax break. And I was like, while that may or may not be true, you could have put that money into an actual business or anything else and had the same tax break. Like you don't need to just throw your money away to some MLM scam. Lo and behold, you know, two three years into it of him paying like hundreds of dollars every month into this pyramid scheme, uh, never selling a single product, having a bunch of useless vitamins you know stack up in his house, uh, the IRS. Aud- like audits him and says you can't write off something that's never made money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I think you get what do you get? Like you get like three years. I think if you do, if you haven't made money by three years, then the IRS is like, okay, this is not a real business. I think it's two years. Is and it I two? Think, okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure with like network marketing, like they're, they're even harder on that because they they know that you know 99 percent people never make money from it anyway. So yeah, it's it's stupid. And then like you kind of just got you you just destroyed your. Your, your chances of starting an actual business or investing in something else. So I don't know. I would say talk to your 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 CPA or your, uh, your tax guy before you make this investment and see you know if this would actually be a tax write-off, how much it would be for. And if you have taken that money and put it into a different investment or somewhere else, if you would get a similar tax write-off. Because if you do, then there's no specific reason why you should invest in this. Yeah, these deductions are not exclusive to a car wash or a, an ATM or whatever it may be. I think there's quite a few different asset classes you could apply those to. I did find it interesting, though, that um, you can deduct a lot more from a car wash or a gas station just because of the way it's it's zoned as a business. I was looking up this uh, this Tommy's Express car wash because that's where his fund is. It's, it's like a franchise quick car wash place where you can get um, a membership I think for like 30 or 40 bucks a month, you can have unlimited washes. And he said the average cost is like a dollar a wash, which sounds crazy cheap to me. So assuming that the person doesn't get a wash every single day, there's probably someone out there that does, but I'm sure that's the vast minority. You're automatically profitable by using this subscription model. And I think that's really smart of them to focus on the subscription model. I actually looked up their locations. They have 137 locations across the US right now. There's actually a few in California. Um, they're pretty far out of LA, maybe like an hour, but there, there are a few out here. I've just never heard of this brand, but looking at the map, they, they got spots all over the US. Yeah, I mean, that actually as a business uh, is something I would use as a customer if it was on my way back, you know, to, you know, 
from, from my daily commute because it sounds like a cool model, uh, assuming that the lines don't get super long or, um, you know, the, it actually works well because uh, I do like having a clean car. So that sounds like it could be good. And obviously, he wants to invest in businesses that will actually make money because, you know, for him to get paid, it, it needs to have that 75% return first for him to to start getting money from it. But it does sound like a very convenient way for him to have a lot of upside potential going forward after those, you know, a couple of years or five years. So I respect that he's in it for the long run and that it sounds like these are, you know, trying to be legitimate businesses. I just, you know, I think I put it in the same category as a building developer or an apartment developer that has these big dreams and and ambitions of becoming you know very profitable but they don't really have any skin in the game like all all the money all the risk is is coming from someone else and if it doesn't work out you know oh well that's a, that's a solid point and um i guess and yeah and, and 100 of everything after he pays you out is, is all coming back to him it, it is a, it is an interesting model um i will attest to having a, the clean car thing i just bought a new car last week Johnny, it's rained, I think I've had it seven days. It's rained five out of the seven days. So I have this brand new car and I'm just staring at it dirty and I don't want to wash it because it's just going to rain the next day. Well, if you had an unlimited uh, Tommy's car wash description, you wouldn't, you wouldn't mind. And I would use it every day. I'm like, I'm getting my money's worth. <laughs> Let's. Can we talk about one thing that I, I did not like at all? And it's not, It's it has nothing to do with Dave. It's, it's the, uh, I guess his customers of it. The Bitcoin ATM. Who is the person using the Bitcoin ATM? I mean, it is actually useful if you happen to have, you already have Bitcoin and you want to take out some cash and you don't want to go through like a person, you know, that you have to like talk to on Telegram and meet somewhere. So I can see that being a thing. I just think that the use case is so small. Like so few people actually own Bitcoin. And so few people have a way to actually, you know, have it on like a wallet or something where they can actually go use a Bitcoin ATM. I, I'll, I'll tell you my experience with them. I've seen a lot of Bitcoin ATMs. I've seen them in Chiang Mai. I've seen them in like a couple of different cities or countries. They have never worked. They've always been out of order. Really? I've, I've seen them. I've never seen anyone on them. And, and, and just it defeats the whole purpose of Bitcoin if you really believe in Bitcoin that then why are you using an ATM? I think it's for people that don't understand Bitcoin. Yeah, I don't know. I, th I think it just sounds like something that should exist. And I don't know. Like, for example, in uh, is it Venezuela that they that they decided to use Bitcoin? No. Um, not Venezuela. Uh, hold on. It was a country in South America. <laughs> El Salvador. Yeah. So in El Salvador, you know, I don't know. I guess they're or they wouldn't even need to convert into cash because then they're supposed to just pay, you know, with it online. But in general, like the idea of Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency actually being usable in everyday life has been an idea for the last, you know, five years or so. And I kept thinking, oh, you know, yeah, it's kind of new. Maybe they just need to, you know, get the Lightning Network to work or get these Bitcoin ATMs to work or get whatever to work. It's been like five years. Like they yeah. still can't. They still can't do it. <laughs> I I sold all my crypto. I mentioned it a couple episodes back at the end of the year, and I had planned to buy back in Bitcoin, and I'm not. I'm just over it. And another thing, this morning, I on my way here, I was checking my email, and I got an email from PayPal. I think my account got hacked. It says you got charged six hundred nineteen dollars and ninety nine cents to pay for a company called Bitcoin Crypto. Yeah, that wasn't ah. me. <laughs> so I'm just one more strike against Bitcoin. I'm just, I'm over it. I'm so over it. Oh, that's funny. Well, let's uh, see at the end of 2023 uh, what our thoughts are on that. But uh, on this investment, are you going to or would you invest in Dave Zook's fund? Well, first of all, I can't because I'm not an accredited investor. And the $100,000 threshold is, is very high. Obviously, if... If you have the funds, um, I th I think I like the car wash one better. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting old and and having morals, but the I just don't like the idea of charging people the ATM fees, and it just feels it feels a little dirty to me. Yeah, I don't know. I I, I just don't believe it's actually three dollars. <laughs> like I, I'm 
I would imagine like maybe if it starts at three dollars and then goes up to like as much as people would you know still be willing to use it, uh, or they start hiding fees in like um, transaction fees, like that's actually how Euronet gets you. So I've used Euronet a lot of times and. I've never actually been screwed by them. It's because I'm super careful. I click, you know, no refuse conversion, uh, you know, um, use local currency. But the thing is, they keep moving it around and they change the language. Right. And they make you do it like multiple times. Then they'll say, are you sure? You know, like, um, you know, I really kind of just screw with you. And imagine if you're not a seasoned traveler or you almost press the wrong button or something, you can get charged a conversion fee where they just give you a really terrible exchange rate so if you're taking out 800 bucks it'll be at least 50 dollars in fees 50 dollars on 800 yeah Oof. that's insane right yeah i see some of those little independent ones um so i live in a very touristy area at, at venice beach uh, a lot of foreigners a lot of european uh tourists and there's those junky little atms that are just like run off like an extension cord out of all the little vendors and those fees are, yeah, like 5 to $10. And then I can imagine if you're a foreign tourist, wherever you're pulling that money from, it's doing the conversion rate, which is probably grabbing you on that. And whatever bank over there is charging you, those fees would, would get out of control really fast. Yeah, absolutely. So the business model itself, you know, it's not my... Uh... Not my favorite. I understand if it makes money, it makes money, you know, and that's not up to me re to regulate. Um, but at the same time, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. Like if I was a corner store and someone came in and said, Hey, can we rent this spot in your corner? We'll give you a third of all the fees. I might say yes. <laughs> right. Especially if I, cause uh, sometimes the, the money that you get from that is actually higher than uh, you would have you would have made actually running your business. It's 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 crazy. Depending on how how high traffic your area is, as an investment, I if I was gonna do it, I would rather just do it on my own uh, if there was some way to do it. And for the ATM, you know, as I said before, it, it'd be hard to scale. So I I I you know obviously wouldn't have a way to do it uh, unless I was on the receiving end of renting out the spot. But for something like the car wash. If Tommy's had like a actual franchise model where you could just invest directly with them to open a Tommy's franchise, that's something that I would actually look into. But going through the fund without the upside potential past 175%, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. So I'm just looking at Tommy's website and they actually do have a franchise button where you can go through there and there's a lot of good information in there. Uh, Dave's site, therealassetinvestor.com. There's not a ton of information and there's no numbers on returns or anything like that. So if, if you're going to invest in something like this, definitely ask for all that. Um, I'm looking at the requirements for a Tommy's car wash. If you want to open up one, Johnny, you need to have a net mm. worth of $2 million mm -hmm. and you need to have a million and a half liquid if you want to actually Oof. fully own it. If you want to lease okay. it, um, you need to have a net worth of 1.5 and a liquid of 1 million. Okay. Ooh. Well, I guess I'm out of that. Franchise fee is $50,000 a year, uh, no matter how, many, how much you sell, and 4% royalty and 1% towards national brand, which I would assume is advertising. So 50,000 okay. plus 5%. Okay. Uh, I don't know how much a car wash would be normally, but that sounds doable. It says, what does it say? Uh, their gross sales, median gross sales are $3.1 million a year. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that doing well. Like, I'd rather open that than a Subway. I say that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Subway is trash. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's, uh, I don't know. It's 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 interesting if you're using it for the tax play. Uh, obviously, talk to talk to your accountant and see if if everything Dave is saying is correct and if it applies to you. And ask them for more information. Um, I'll post the email address uh, that Dave left us. You can email them directly. Let them know that you heard them on Invest Like a Boss, and I'm sure they'd provide you with all the information you're looking for and the website, therealassetinvestor.com. Dave, thanks for coming on the show. Johnny, what other business we got? It's a new year. Well, uh, first off, uh, the Boss Lounge is our free Facebook group. So you can go on there. You can talk about this investment or anything else. Uh, and for our Patreons, we now have a new private Discord server. You want to talk about that? 
as much as I can, I really don't know how to do it. I set it up, but it's um, it's a learning curve. There's a few people in there trying to get it to sync with Patreon, so it should be automatically synced with Patreon. If you are a Patreon um, and you're at the five dollar level, we appreciate that. Nothing's gonna change for you. You're still gonna get access to all our posts in Patreon, and we've been posting a ton of content in there. We got bonus episodes. All our trades and moves, investments, uh, life changes, those are all still accessible to you at $5 level. But if you bump it up to the 10 or higher, you get access to this Discord server. And uh, I hope it's just a, a way for bosses to connect, share ideas, investment ideas, travel ideas. You just got questions for Johnny, Sam, or myself. It should be a, a good way to communicate and make the community stronger. It's still in development. It is live. We're just trying to figure out the tech. Well... Let's see how that goes uh, with something new. It's something we've been putting off for a while, but a couple people have asked for it, so we'll, we'll try it out. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're a Patreon and you're supporting the show, give us some suggestions. We'll try anything once. Like I said, this guest, uh, Dave Zook, that we had on today was a Patreon recommendation. So anything you suggest in Patreon, we take everything seriously, um, even if it's out of out of like weird stuff that we probably wouldn't even normally talk about we're open to, to new ideas we got some good show suggestions coming up on the year and excited for what's to come yeah so go ahead and sign up and troll derek with some uh crazy investment ideas <laughs> see you guys in the next episode thanks for listening to the best like a boss podcast join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.